So good afternoon. Uh, where I am Catherine Tamale. I am a virologist from a Timon University Hospital in Marseille, and my co-chair is Dr. Hervé Tissot-Dipon from the uh, Research and Development Institute in Marseille. So uh, welcome in this uh, emerging infectious disease session. Well, it's my pleasure now to introduce Bruno Lina. Bruno Lina is a professor of microbiology in um, Lyon, and he is, has been the head of the uh, flu, uh, national, national, national Flu uh, Institute since something like 12 years, I think. Yep. And he will now talk about uh, H7N9. Thank you. Flu yeah. Virus. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to show you some data about this uh, new emerging influenza virus. So you just have to remember there are new emerging influenza virus. Don't look at the numbers uh, because it changes uh, on a regular basis. However, with this H7 and 9, the, the picture is kind of different as compared to what we have seen with other viruses. And I, I just want to let you know a little bit about this virus and what is the background about emerging influenza viruses when you have in mind that these viruses may be responsible for pandemics. So these are my, my disclosures. And um, when you talk about flu, you have to talk about different peoples and different guys. Actually, first the, one you, the first one is the, is the virus. These viruses, they are all similar when you look at them. They don't, they don't look different, whatever the subtype you have. You can look at A or Bs or H1, H2, H3. They all look the same. The second actor is the, is, is the human beings, the vector. That's through human-to-human -human transmission that these viruses spread amongst the uh, community. And this virus spreads through airborne. It's an airborne disease. Uh, you can... You can transmit by ants, but first of all, it has to be in the upper respiratory tract to be transmissible from one person to another. And there's a third kind of actors, which are the providers of viruses, and these providers are mainly in the wildlife. And the, the epicenter of all these viruses is the aquatic birds. And from these aquatic birds, there's a large number of viruses that are available, waiting for becoming pandemic viruses. Some will never become pandemic, but some did become pandemic in the past. And you can see that there's a large number of different subtypes of A viruses that are just lying in the wilderness, where you can see that there's about 144 different subtypes that can become a new a virus for human beings. And sometimes there are some introductions into humans, and only in the, last, uh, in the last centuries, H1, H2, and N3 became pandemic viruses, but it doesn't mean that the others can't do it. The good thing for us is that an avian virus can't infect human beings. And the reason for that is that when you look at the virus, there are two key elements in the surface of the virus, which are the two glycoproteins called the hemagglutinin and the neuromidase. And these two components of the virus are acting as binding or receptor destroying, and, and they look at very specific receptors. And these receptors are silic acids. And in our body, the silic acid we have is different to those that the avian virus looks for. So it means that when you're infected with an avian virus on the upper respiratory tract, nothing happens because the virus can't bind and won't infect the cell. However, we know that these viruses can change themselves because they are RNA viruses and, and they have segmented genomes. So you have here the long list that you can't read, but the different things that the virus can do to adapt itself to human beings when it's an avian virus. And some of these changes have been described. And the most important change for a virus to infect human is to change the specificity of binding from an avian receptor to a human receptor. The avian receptor is an silic acid which is in the alpha-2-3 conformation, whilst the human receptor is an silic acid which is an alpha-2-6. So the chemists just know where the, uh, the cyclic cycle is bind, whether it's on the two or on, on sorry, on the, on, on, the, on the three or on the six. But when you look, when we looked at very deeply how these different receptors uh, can be present in the human beings, what was identified 
from a group in, 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 in the Netherlands is that when you look at the nasal, paranasal, pharyngeal receptors, they're all alpha-2,6. But when you look at the alveolar level, then there are some cells that have the alpha-2,3 receptor. And these cells are the pneumocysts type 2. So if an influenza virus, an avian influenza virus, can reach the alveoli, then it can look for cells that have the proper receptor, and then the infection can occur, which explains how some people do get infected with avian viruses. It's because the receptor is there. But the receptor is there and only there. And if you want to transmit virus from human to human, you have to be infected at the upper respiratory tract level. If you're only infected at the lower re respiratory tract level, it won't spread. So that's what we see when we have avian or viruses coming from the wilderness that infects human beings. It infects the pneumocyst type 2, but it remains at the lung level. It doesn't go up at the upper respiratory tract level. It's only if there's some changes in the binding of the HA that occurs during replication, for example, that this virus can switch from an alpha-2,3 to an alpha-2,6 or to a mixed binding. Then the virus can infect the upper respiratory tract sample, the specimen, cells, and would be transmissible from human to human. This is a very important change that has to occur. Until this change did not occur, until the changes occur, nothing will happen. If it occurs, then there may be a pandemic. And the ways the different viruses can change is by two different means, either by reassortment or by mutation. And that's what the virus did in the past. When you look at 1918 pandemic, which was an H1N1, it was due to a purely avian virus that switched from an alpha-2,3 to an alpha-2,6 binding, plus other changes. It, so it was, an, uh, it was supposed to be uh, an avian virus. And this switch was linked to four changes in amino acids in, in, the, in the pocket where the, uh, the, the receptor binding is, is occurring. So it's a very limited number of changes that can make the switch from alpha-2,3 to alpha-2,6. But there are other ways of uh, having an emerging viruses from, from, from wildlife, which is the reassortment. Reassortment is very simple. The virus, uh, the influenza virus, has a segmented genome. This segmented genome is eight segments. Each genome codes for one to three protein. When you have a co-infection in some cells, what happens is that some gene segments can switch from one virus to the other virus. And if by doing so, this virus acquires capacity for replication in, in a different cell. Then it can become a new virus that would be adapted to human beings. And that is what happened in 57, in 68, and in 2009. Actually, these viruses were, first of all, avian viruses, and they mixed themselves in pigs, and then they were transferred to humans. That's exactly what happens the three, for the three last pandemics. But what we do see, that is that the mortality associated to these viruses is much less than what we did see for, for the, the pandemic in 1918. So what about H7 and 9? What do we know now? H7 and 9 is a reassortant. It comes from wild birds, and it comes from a large range of different wild birds and from viruses that we know from quite a long time. The H9N2 virus has been discovered in, in Asia and in China uh, in 1899. So it's, it's a virus that is circulating there for more than 15 years. And this H9N2 viruses has different lineages, and they have been resorting with two other viruses, and this made the H7N9 virus. The important thing is that this H9N2 virus has changed a little bit and it's quite well adapted to humans. So it, this virus has some specificity that makes it a human-like virus. It is not a human virus, but it is a human-like virus with some of the features, and it has been responsible for infections in humans. This virus emerged in China, uh, mainly in the, in, in, the, in the eastern part of China, uh, in the February of, of last year. And what we did is there was a very limited number of cases and this occurred without any context of epidemics in poultry. Usually what we see is that you have an epidemic in poultry, 
and then the poultry which is sick is infecting the, the human beings and then the human beings are sick and so forth. There's no uh, animal sick with H7N9. It doesn't, uh, it, it, there's no mortality associated with this virus. It's not a highly pathogenic virus, it's just a regular virus. But nevertheless, when you look at the infection, this quite, the, the trend of infection is in that this, there's a sharp increase. So, although the figures remain pretty low, but it's 45 at the, minimum, uh, at the maximum in, in the Green Jan, uh, region. And when you look at the map, well, it's purely located in the eastern part of China, and there's no really spread like we did see with other viruses. There's, there was a case in Taiwan, but there was somebody that was infected in Shanghai. And after the first wave, that I call that a wave, which means by the end of, of, uh, of uh, uh, June last year, there was one, uh, 133 cases and almost 40 deaths, which is about 30% mortality. And what was really striking is that these deaths were recorded in large cities. And you would expect most, most of all to, to have these cases in not in cities, but in, in, in non-urban area. And all these cases were related to wet market, where you have live poultry which is sold. And what, you, what, what, what was decided then is to close this wet market. And when you look into more details of the cases in the large city, we did see that the mortality was very high there as well. So it was in the large cities, and that was where th there was the highest level of mortality. And there was a peak, really. And when the wet market were closed, well, the, we, the peak went down. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the epidemic was over. Because we know from the H5N1 uh, um, situation that there's a kind of seasonality in these emerging viruses. So maybe it's just disappearing for a period of time and it will reappear after all. So after 2013, what we knew is that the virus is avian, definitely avian. It's not, uh, it's not highly pathogenic. There is no epidemic identified in the poultry, so it's difficult to chase the virus there. So we don't know wh where the source of infection is. When, when the poultry is sick, you kill the poultry. You kill the birds, and then the virus is disappearing while you kill the bird. You can't do that for, for H7 and 9 because they know that you can't identify where the reservoir is, actually. Humans can be infected when they live or when they visit close to uh, bird markets. Most of the cases are in large cities, and they're mostly observed in adults and elderly, which is not the same as for H5N1, which was mostly observed in very young kids. Mortality is 30%, no human-to-human -human transmission. But by the end of last year, what we were asking whether this was something that would reappear this year, would there be any seasonality in the distribution of these cases? Would this virus adapt itself a little bit further? And would there be a larger diffusion because the cluster was just located at the eastern part of China? I wanted to show you this. It's the seasonality of H5N1. It's the worldwide H5N1. And you do see that there are peaks during the winter period. And there's no cases during summer. So what happened is we, we shall see. And again, when I told you that there was a difference according to the, to, to, to the seasonality, it's, it's exactly the same. Sorry, I, I, I was supposed to skip that, that slide. So there was a difference in the age group. You, you, the light blue is the age 5 and 1. The dark blue is the age 7 and 9. And you do see that the younger cases is recorded in age 5 and 1, while the age 7 and 9 is observed in, in older people. Why is it so? It's quite simple. The H7N9 has the capacity to bind alpha to 6 as well as alpha to 3, whilst the H5N1 can't bind alpha to 3. If you want to infect somebody, you have to, to take the route from the beginning of the entry until the very end. In kids, it's short. In adults, it's long. So the virus can't most of H5N1, when you are close to the, to the poultry, can't get through the uh, alveoli of the adults. While they bind very well, they can get through the alveoli of the kids because just of the size of the, of the lungs and, and, the, and, bronch and bronchus and so forth. Second year, what happens last year? Well, 
there was a sharp peak, and there was an increase in the number of cases three times more than last year. This virus did, did not change over the period of time. It remains identical, although there are now two genome groups that are circulating. Not much changes. The percentage of mortality remains the same. The region where the virus is circulating is a little bit larger, but it remains the eastern part of China. And there's no spreading, there's no widespreading of this virus. Although now it hurts Shanghai, it, it hurts Hong Kong, and it hurts Beijing. These are very large cities. These are very, very large cities. And we know that the wet markets there are infected with these viruses, H7 and 9. And you can see that, for example, Guangdong, which is close to Hong Kong, you have now 120 cases, while well, there was no cases last year. Zhejiang, which is also uh, a place cl close to Shanghai, there's, there's a very large number of cases. So again, close to the large cities, there's a very large number of cases of this virus, which is pretty adapted to human beings. When you compare this to H5N1, the third year of H5N1 was the year when it spread all over the, uh, the, 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 the old world. Uh, that was the time when it reached the, uh, east, the western part of Europe. It was three years after the emergence of these viruses. But, and there were two different clades that were circulating at that time, and that's the second clade that spread, not the first one. I don't want to make any, uh, any comparison because the viruses are really different, but nevertheless, we have to be cautious. When you look at the cases, again, you compare H5N1 and H7N9, it's exactly the same as last year. It hits the elderly people and the, uh, and the adults, not the young, whilst the H5N1 is eating the young one. So should we scream and alert everybody, there's a new pandemic coming, we have to stockpile viruses, we have to stockpile vaccine, we have to stockpile masks, and so forth? Well, no. But we have to keep a close eye on these viruses because the virus binds human receptors, all human receptors. It has virulence factors, indeed. There is absolutely no control of H7N9 in poultry because we don't know where to look for it. It's, it's just impossible to, to detect where, is the, uh, the, 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 where it's coming from because there's only a limited number of poultry which is infected, five to 10% in one, uh, in one place, and there's no big epidemic among the poultry. Humans are infected in, when they're in contact with poultry. You're not infected when you just walk by. It's because you visited wet market, because you've been close to animals that were infected. Most of the cases are observed in large city, and it remains true. And in large city with large airports, and the mortality did not uh, diminish, it's still 30%. It's important to keep in mind that China is a place where there's a lot of airports, where there's a lot of large cities, and which is very easy to spread the virus if this virus was transmissible from human to human. It is not the case yet. The problem is that we don't know why. It has all the features we know for human to human transmission, but it doesn't transmit. It means that there's something that still blocks us from understanding exactly what are the reasons for human to human transmission, but nevertheless, we have to keep an eye on that, and if the chain of transmission starts, then it can spread very fast. And when you look at the ways the virus spread, the H1N1 virus spread all over the world, it took six weeks to be in the five continents for H1N1. But the mortality was less than one point, sorry, 0 0.001%, which is not the case for H7N9. So we have to be cautious. And I will end with that, just with thanking the people that are working with me and, and the collaborators on different projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruno, for this outstanding presentation. Is there any questions from the floor? No? Very elegant presentation. What about the immunity? What about the antibodies? Do they provide we protection and 
but we had no immunity like we had for H1N1. There's no cross-reactive antibodies. Uh, H1N1 was, was really uh, a, a weird pandemic because it was a, a virus that was coming from 1918. So we, we, I mean, all the people that were older than 50, 55, 60 years of age, they, they had antibodies, so they were protected. This is not the case with this virus. We have no protecting antibody. There was a, there, there's been a kind of several screenings that have been done, and when you look at normal people, when you look for cell protection, it's nothing. And cellular protection is the same, nothing. Any other questions? It's more a curiosity. Is the neuroimmunities of this virus sensitive to current antiviral drugs that we are using against influenza? Yes, the, the, these are sensitive to Zanamivir or Zeltamivir. They're resistant to amantadine. Uh, but we have already seen a case where the virus uh, developed resistance against Zeltamivir uh, by a 292 mutation. And this virus was fit, which is a problem as well. Thank you. Another one. Congratulations for this very nice overview. Uh, I have a stupid question. Um, do, do, do you mean that there is um, any way to, to, to decrease the, the level of virus in uh, the, the reservoir, in the, in the bird, on the egg? No. 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 No, I mean, uh, you have to kill all the wild birds, which is something nobody would do. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Bruno. Catherine, I'd like to introduce the next speaker. So, next speaker is Dr. Muller uh, from the Institute of Virology, uh, University of Bonn. And the topic is MERS CoV. Well, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation here to Marseille. It's a I can just say it's really a beautiful city. It's my second time. And uh, I will give you an update on the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, and I hope to give you some insights into this newly emerged pathogen. So uh, talking about human coronaviruses, uh, here's a picture, just an uh, electron microscopic picture. And this is also why they are called coronaviruses, because you see they make up a nice corona. What you see here, the spikes, these are the spike proteins, and they are um, sticking out of the particles. There are single-stranded enveloped RNA viruses, up to 30,000 nucleotides. Um, and I guess most of you will have antibodies against the common cold coronaviruses that are uh, shown down here. So we have 229E, NL63, OC43. These are um, coronaviruses that make up 10% of the common colds each year. Um, then we had SARS coronavirus uh, that emerged in 2002, 2003, and that was causing severe acute respiratory syndrome. Uh, so that was clearly different from the coronaviruses that we've known so far. Um, the other ones discovered in the 1960s and SARS, a new one. So the impact of SARS um, summarized here. So you see that, um, well, health-wise, 8,000 people were infected and 800 deaths. Uh, making up a 10% case fatality rate. And what, so what was frightening about SARS coronavirus 2003 was that it spread rapidly, similar to, to uh, influenza viruses. Within a couple of months, it was everywhere. Um, not everywhere, but in many different countries. Um, the economic losses were up to 50 billion US dollars because of restrictions, travel restrictions, and so on and so forth. So now there is this new coronavirus called Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, and we had the first case in 2012. Um, this was a 60-year-old patient in Saudi Arabia, and he had seven days of fever, cough, uh, a lack of breath. So similar to the, severe, uh, to the acute respiratory distress syndromes, uh, that um, doctors saw with the SARS patients. And Dr. Ali Zaki, um, the, the treating doctor at that kind, would, uh, of this patient, he was very thoughtful and uh, did it the old-fashioned way. So he took samples from the patient and uh, did a virus isolation on cell culture and tried to figure out what kind of virus is causing these symptoms. 
and he didn't find it initially. And uh, when he sent these samples to Ron Fouchier's lab in Rotterdam, they figured out that they had found a new coronavirus. So we had two cases in Germany so far, and one of the cases uh, in Munich, in imported cases from, uh, from Qatar, um, and we, we did some viral load and uh, assessment and seeing, you know, uh, how do patients shed virus, and we saw that um, low respiratory tract specimens showed high virus loads, but also upper tract respiratory um, uh, specimens were positive. But uh, we know now that this is a virus that is predominantly replicating deep down in the lungs, which is similar to uh, what my colleague said before, um, is one of the factors that is preventing the virus to spread efficiently from human to human, luckily so far. Um, the reason for this is the receptor. So uh, the d peptidase 4 is mainly expressed in the lower parts of the, of the lungs. And uh, my colleagues in Utrecht and Rotterdam, they were highly efficient identifying the receptor. And I really, uh, was really happy to contribute to this uh, great publication uh, that was published in Nature, finding, identifying the, uh, the receptor. So here's just an example of the, ex uh, of the data. Um, we have here non-susceptible COS7 cells. And if you provide those cells with the receptor, uh, you see that the virus replicates. Uh, if you look at the uh, immunofluorescent staining here of human bronchiolar tissue and human airway epithelial cells, you see that in red, DPP4 is the receptor, is present on non-ciliated cells. And this is uh, different from SARS because SARS was uh, present in ciliated cells, tubulin positive, and the receptor of SARS, which was ACE2, was also present on ciliated cells. So there is a clear difference between SARS and MERS. When we looked at the immune response here in cell culture assay, so we took human airway epithelial cells and um, infected those cells with uh, different viruses, so 229E, a common cold virus, SARS, and MERS. Uh, we saw that um, here, fold induction and the different um, interference-stimulated genes and genes that are usually upregulated when a virus is identified by the cells as an intruder, and we see that no there is no upregulation, so MERS does not induce the innate immune response in infected cells. So it's hiding from the immune system. Um, but what, um, what we could sh see was that if we pre-incubated cells with interferon um, and the upregulation of interferon-stimulated genes, these are protective proteins that, uh, that can counteract viruses, that this is highly efficient in case of MERS in comparison to SARS. So um, this is um, something that could be also uh, taken up, this idea, um, when, when it comes to treatment options. So my colleagues in Montana, Heinz Feldman's lab, they uh, tried interferon as a treatment, interferon alpha-2b in combination with ribavirin, and they applied this treatment uh, in rhesus macaques and saw that this is an efficient treatment when you treat early enough and uh, with the right dose. The problem that we encounter right now is that people that are entering the, uh, uh, the, the hospitals, they come far too late. They are also, the, the, the MERS uh, has, has been progressed um, too far. So the treatment of uh, interferon and ribavirin has so far not shown um, any, any uh, benefit in, in patients that were treated with uh, those drugs. If you look at the distribution of MERS cases, uh, well, as of May 19th, we had 658 cases and 178 deaths. So the case fatality rate is right now 27%, uh, which is still much higher than for SARS. And we have a clear hotspot here, and that is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia with 550 cases. And an interesting phenomenon, and again, I can just... Uh, uh, say this is similar to, to uh, what uh, my colleague uh, um, Bruno Lina said, uh, we have seasonality. So you have increase of human cases every time in April. So 2012, we had the first cases in Jordan. 2013, we had a peak here. It's rather small in comparison to 2014, where we have this massive increase. One has to say um, that this might be biased a little bit because uh, Saudi Arabia is testing right now 
um, like every person that is just uh, that that is coughing more or less. So there has been some some increase in testing, and this is of course biasing uh, the the detection of cases. But please remember this seasonality because I will come to that later. Some descriptive epidemiology. So we see that most of the infected so far are males. Um, 61% and the majority of, of uh, the, the people are infected ha are suffering from severe clinical symptoms. But there is one reason that plays a factor here and that is the factor of comorbidity because it was shown that most of the cases that got infected and had severe outcome had comorbidities. So they had either diabetes or asthma or other, um, other uh, problems. And uh, when we look at the numbers, we can clearly say that primary cases tend to be uh, comorbid and have a fatal outcome. So what we've been um, analyzing and, and trying to find out where does this virus come from, and when you know where it comes from, of course, you can uh, do, uh, do and try to, to prevent the um, introduction into the human population. For SARS, um, we knew that SARS was um, originating from bats and um, there were like uh, intermediate hosts like palm civets that were, that were traded on the wet markets. And, but it's clear that uh, SARS originated from Rhinolophus bats. And this is the reason why we focused on bats because we've been doing that for the last years. And we had lots of bat samples in our freezers so we were looking for MERS viruses in those samples. And um, <clears throat> what we found, you see here a phylogenetic tree, and uh, all those blue ones are um, the, the human cases that all had a link to the Middle East, and the, the, um, the most closely related virus we found in, the, uh, in bats was um, found in South Africa so far in uh, this Neoromitia uh, bat shown here. So this is an, uh, a MERS ancestor that we found in those bats, and that is more closely related than all the other viruses that have been shown uh, uh, in bats or even in hedgehogs. <clears throat> so all insectivorous uh, animals. Um, what kind of, um, what kind of um, also is interesting, our first observations that we made, um, we have a lot of bat cell lines in the lab that I've been uh, um, able to generate over the last years. So when we got the virus isolate in September 2012, we of course tried to put it on different cell lines and what we saw when we compared SARS with MERS that, um, that all the bat cell lines that I uh, used were uh, susceptible to the virus. So it has a broad kind of, uh, in fact, the broad um, um, uh, species. And it also replicates in goat and camel cells, uh, which my colleague in the lab did, Isabella Eckele. And um, so we have bats and we have ungulates that uh, were infectable with the virus in cell cultures. And this has to do um, uh, with the, uh, if you look at the receptor, and the, this is the phylogeny of a DPP4 receptor MERS binding site, you see here are human DPP4, uh, you have rabbit and horses, pigs, bovine, and sheep. So these are really closely related. Um, and uh, this, this is certainly one of the reasons why, uh, why these cells are uh, infectable. So we've been discussing in the lab and with my colleagues, uh, the coronavirologists, uh, what is happening right now. So we found ancestors in bats. We know that these bat cells and, and camel cells were infectable. Uh, with the virus, um, so could this be um, the chain of transmission? And what we did was we uh, did uh, zero surveys and livestock in MERS-affected countries. So here, Jordan, uh, United uh, Arab Emirates, and Oman, and we found astonishingly um, amounts of zero positive camels. Like first, when, when I saw the results, I thought this is unspecific. This cannot be true because the first samples we had were 100% positive. So we, we optimized, we, we did all uh, sorts of confirmatory assays, and we did the uh, neutralization test, which is the gold standard in coronavirology, um, for, co uh, for coronavirus serology. And um, we could confirm this. So all these um, camels that we had had antibodies against MERS coronavirus. So the first question then was, of course, what 
where is the virus in these animals? There must be virus if they are all seropositive. And uh, we had one case, a human and camel parallel infection. So we had uh, a case in Jeddah where we knew this, there was a man that had MERS coronavirus and this man had contacts, close contacts to camels. And um, if you look at the phylogenetic tree, uh, here, this is the, the camel that we, the camel nucleic acids we isolated from the camels, and this is the patient, and you see they are highly similar. So from this figure, you cannot really uh, know if the human had infected the camel or the camel the human. This is really a difficult question that has been raised uh, since the first camel MERS viruses have been found. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, this timeline here, the transmission from camels to humans in Jeddah is more likely because um, when you, when you uh, look at the uh, outcome of the, um, we interviewed um, the people on site and they said that the camels had some sort of respiratory disease early October and uh, the human case was, uh, uh, had onset of disease end of October and uh, we tested human and camel samples uh, positive in November and we took some samples from the, the, from the camel consecutively and performed serology and we could see that uh, here, immunofluorescence assay, that we had an increase in titer in those PCR-positive camels, so they were really infected and, and zero-converted. Uh, so it is a possibility that the camels are really replicating the virus and could infect uh, the humans. Another strong link um, that is now showing up is the uh, identification of the first African camel MERS virus um, by our colleagues from Hong Kong and Egypt. And uh, when you now do a phylogenetic analysis and you take this Neuromycia virus, which is uh, the, the related virus we found in bats, and then you take uh, the camel virus they found in Northern Africa, it's really basal to all the other human and camel sequences that we know so far. So this raises the question, is the camel a reservoir or is it a host? What we would expect for a reservoir is a broad temporal and spatial distribution. So, you know, many camels should be infected and um, this is what we try to investigate. And another thing that you have to bear in mind is where are the camels and where are many camels? And if you look at this chart, you see that more than six million camels live in this area in Eastern Africa. And most of the camels that are living in the Arabian Peninsula are really imported from this area. So what we tried is we tried to gather uh, all sorts of serum samples from all over the place in Africa and uh, Arabia. And uh, we tried to go back in time as far as possible. And collaborators in Kenya, um, they, they gave us some samples from 1983 and 84. And we could really find neutralizing antibodies in these Somalian and uh, Sudanese camels. And all the other kind of studies already showed that uh, by us and others uh, that camels really have been uh, infected years ago with MERS or MERS-like viruses, so closely related ones. If you now look at all the study sites, you see that there is a, a vast distribution of, P, uh, of, um, of seropositive camels uh, with, uh, with these hot spots here in Eastern Africa with uh, high seropositivity. So finally, I would like to show you my, the current model that we've been discussing in the lab recently. It's, uh, I call it the kindergarten working hypothesis because it's, of course, not proven yet. Um, so we find these MERS-related virus, so the species MERS-related virus in bats in Africa. And um, how this bat virus entered the camel population, I don't know. I've just been in Riyadh last week, and uh, there was a doctor telling me that some camel, you know, uh, shepherds, they give their camels shredded bats as a cure, so anything is possible. So I don't know, but this is still something that we don't know yet. But if this is true, that the ancestors of MERS are in, uh, are in bats, then once upon a time we had the introduction um, into, into the camel population. And what we know is that um, camels, adult camels, they transfer via the colostrum maternal antibodies to their juveniles. And usually those juveniles are born in February, March. 
and it was shown that young camels are protected for up to five weeks by maternal antibodies. And uh, so upon the waning of those antibodies, of course, they might become susceptible for, uh, for MERS. And this is exactly the time point when we see all those human, this increase in human infections. So another point that could be a reason is that what we see for coronaviruses is that you can be reinfected. So every one of you has been infected by coronaviruses all through the life, and some of you have been reinfected by the, by the same uh, species of coronavirus uh, because of the waning of your neutralizing antibodies. And this could also happen, of course, in camel populations, and this is kind of the circulation of the virus in the camel populations and then the introduction into humans. The so what can we do finally? Well, there have been some vaccine candidates tested in mice. We have an MVA-based vaccine and infectious clone-based. Um, but of course, we have one challenge, and that is the animal model. We have well, my colleagues have tested all sorts of animals and none seem to be really perfect. Like ferrets didn't work, mice, hamsters. The only model that is currently available is the rhesus macaques and that's certainly not the optimal model for further research there. So let me conclude. Um, MERS is using DPP-4, which is down deep in the lung um, and it infects non-ciliated airway epithelial cells. The virus shedding is more in the lower, but also in the upper respiratory tract. So people that are in the intensive care units working with patients and doing the intubations, they have to be careful. MERS suppresses uh, recognition by the immune system, but is interferon sensitive, and the combination therapy of ribavirin with interferon showed effects in primate models. African bats carry ancestors of MERS in um, andromedary camels host MERS CoV with broad spatial and temporal distribution. Well, it seems to me that MERS seems to be a common cold virus, more or less, for camels, because they have a long neck. That's very interesting what you said. So it could be that the virus is not getting down deep into the lungs. So they might have a you know, tickling throat, and, and this is it. So they spread the virus, and that's it. So it's, it's not like they suffer, because there, there hasn't been any... Uh, you know, uh, many of dromedary camels die-offs in the last years that would explain any of this. Uh, what is really interesting now and what we are into is looking at the diversity of the camel-associated MERS coronaviruses because if camels are the reservoir, they should have a large diversity of different MERS viruses. So the kindergarten hypothesis, young camels are the predominant target of infection and this synchronized yearly cycle with parturition in the winter months may explain the increase in spring. Um, one big question is, of course, why are there no reported human cases in Africa if all those African camels are positive? And we are trying to figure that one out. We are collaborating with Kenya and other uh, countries to get some serum samples and look at the serum prevalence in those countries. So far, I cannot tell you anything about this. Um, well, no results so far. So I don't know. Probably it's um, nobody is testing there and nobody is seeing it, or it's probably that the MERS viruses that we see now have been adapted to human transmissibility. There are first vaccines developed, but research is hampered by the lack of suitable animal models. And finally, I would like to thank a lot of people. First of all, my, uh, my boss, Christian Drosten at the University of Bonn Medical Center, Victor Coleman, Doreen, and Jan Felix. Uh, they have been the real MERS players in the last years, uh, one and a half years. Um, and of course, our collaborators in Rotterdam that provided the virus just a couple of days after they, they had it um, to us, and, and they were really generous, Bart Hachmanns and uh, the group uh, Berend Jan Bos um, for um, collaboration on, on the spike proteins. Uh, Volker Thiel, Ziad Memesh of the Ministry of Health, he's, uh, he's been collaborating with us um, lately, and Erik Latwein from Euroimmune, um, who has um, helped out with serological assays. The funding, DFG, BMBF, and EU funding uh, from the FP7. So this is my recommendation for you. You shouldn't kiss a camel. Thanks for the attention. Thank you for this extremely interesting and uh, clear presentation. Thank you. We have time for one or two quick questions from the floor. <laughs> Isn't there someone is sneezing? <laughs> <laughs>
I'm not wearing a mask. <laughs> I, sorry. Um, I think about 20 years ago, people showed that CD26 was a co-receptor for HIV. Yeah. Although that was not true at the very end. And a lot of CD26 inhibitors were developed. Mm -hmm. Do you have data that CD26 inhibitors really block the virus? Well, yeah, there have been some um, some works recently showing that it works in, in I think, cell culture experiments. Uh, the animal models are lacking, so this is a problem. Um, what we know is that the uh, enzyme activity is not necessary, that's clear, uh, of the DPP4. So if you use DPP4 inhibitors that are inhibiting the enzymatic um, function, that doesn't have any effect. But if you use anti, uh, if you block uh, DPP4, um, you, you, pr uh, you inhibit the MERS infection. So it could be still possible that there is an other receptor besides CD26 that can be involved in the entry of this virus? Well, what we know um, is that there are cofactors. Mm -hmm. So coronaviruses are usually um, have an entry by uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis. But there are also other pathways um, where um, proteases are involved, that you have a direct fusion of the virus particle with a plasma membrane. So there, there are other options as well. But DPP4 is clearly the receptor, because if you block the receptor by antibody pre-incubation in cell culture, you won't get any entry. But there are some assisting proteases that help. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so we now move to the two last presentations. They will be more local. Uh, they, they will be done by Emilie Javel and uh, Catherine Marie Moutou. Uh, they work respectively in the military teaching hospital in Marseille and uh, the, the, the Army Center for Epidemiology and Public Health in Marseille. And they have been studying extensively on a clinical part point of view and on uh, an epidemiological point of view, the huge um, chikungunya epidemic in La Réunion Island since six years now. Yeah. So Emily will so present much. on uh, clinical aspects and Catherine on more epidemiological ones. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for this kind invitation. So I'll talk about post chikungunya chronic disorders. Um, this is a six-year experience from La Réunion Island. Uh, what concerns the clinical spectrum and the use of uh, methotrexate uh, to treat uh, the inflammatory forms. So, um, post chikungunya uh, chronic rheumatisms were uh, first reported in the 80s in South Africa. Um, this is uh, Brighton who first reported persistent joint pain uh, six, uh, three years after an acute chikungunya infection. And he also uh, first described uh, a destructive polyarthritis uh, following chikungunya infection. And he proposed um, to uh, treat this patient uh, with a chloroquine phosphate treatment. Um, Tikungunya is uh, currently re-emerging uh, as the emergence uh, has started in uh, 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 sorry, uh, 2004 in the uh, Indian Ocean and uh, had, has uh, spread then uh, throughout the world, uh, even reaching uh, France in uh, 2010. And uh, more recently, Tikungunya has first entered uh, the Americas and uh, there is uh, now an outbreak in uh, uh, Central America with uh, more than 45,000 uh, uh, suspected cases. So here you have all the clinical descriptions uh, what concern uh, long-lasting uh, uh, rheumatic uh, disorders. And um, globally, uh, the prevalence of patients still suffering after an acute chikungunya infection is uh, waning down, uh, but never down to zero, uh, probably because of the 5% uh, of patients uh, who develop uh, inflammatory chronic uh, disorders. Uh, indeed, uh, the clinical uh, spectrum is wide uh, uh, from uh, uh, chronic pains uh, to uh, real uh, chronic uh, destructive rheumatisms. Here you have uh, an illustration. Uh, here you have a patient uh, who suffers from uh, polyarthralgia with edema. Um, here you have a patient complaining for uh, shoulder arthritis uh, linked with uh, calcification. And uh, here you have a patient develop, who developed uh, a hand stiffness after a chikungunya infection. So there is a, a wide clinical spectrum. 
But uh, the problem is today that there, there are no guidelines uh, to treat uh, these patients, and uh, some, some drugs have been uh, tested but without efficacy. Uh, for instance, uh, ribavirin and uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, were tested. Um, a uh, recent uh, report um, with the methotrexate and TNF uh, blockers uh, appears uh, to reveal an efficacy in post chronic inflammatory rheumatisms. That's the reason why uh, we conduced uh, this uh, study. Um, the first aim was to describe uh, post chronic uh, rheumatic musculoskeletal disorders, what concerns the features, the severity and the burden, and uh, in this cohort, we must uh, focus on uh, de novo chronic inflammatory rheumatisms to evaluate uh, methotrexate efficacy. Um, we conduce, uh, conduced a retrospective uh, descriptive uh, study uh, in uh, La Réunion uh, in uh, two centers of rheumatology. And uh, we collected uh, data uh, from uh, medical files uh, six years after uh, the outbreak. Uh, we, use, uh, we collected data what concerns demography, medical, clinical, biological, and imaging data, and we focused on the treatment uh, that uh, the, the patient had uh, received and uh, their efficacy. Alors, uh, we included uh, all patients uh, referred to the rheumatologist uh, for uh, symptoms related to their chikungunya infection, and uh, persisting more than four months after the outbreak. Uh, chikungunya virus infection was biologically confirmed, and in this, uh, this uh, cohort, uh, we identified uh, patients uh, who were naive uh, for chronic or recurrent joint pains before the acute chikungunya infection. Uh, this patient uh, had de novo post-chikungunya uh, rheumatic disorders. Among them, we screened patients for uh, criteria of uh, chronic inflammatory rheumatisms using uh, validated rheumatologic uh, criteria. Uh, we classify them so as having a rheumatoid, uh, poly, uh, rheumatoid polyarthritis if they fulfilled uh, the American College of Rheumatology criteria, as uh, having a spondyloarthropathy if they fulfilled the European Spondyloarthropathy Study Group criteria, and uh, other patients who had uh, chronic uh, polyarthritis uh, were uh, classified as undifferentiated polyarthritis. We assessed uh, the severity of the rheumatisms uh, uh, searching for uh, radiographic destructions, and we evaluated uh, the functional impairment, uh, what concerned uh, the job, uh, the daily activities, and uh, the uh, psychological impact. We defined uh, methotrexate uh, efficacy as the absence of failure, and failure was defined as uh, the, the need for a switch or uh, an escalation uh, of treatments. Uh, statistically, uh, using Fisher exact test, we searched for methotrexate efficacy, and uh, its uh, determinants uh, included uh, the age, the gender, the type of rheumatism, the destructive course, and uh, the early time of introduction. In this study, we defined an early time as an introduction within the first year of the course of the rheumatism. So the result, um, we included 159 uh, patients. Among them, 122 had de novo rheumatic manifestations. Um, 94 uh, met uh, criteria for a chronic inflammatory rheumatisms. 40 uh, patients had uh, rheumatoid polyarthritis. Uh, 12 of them were positive for rheumatoid factors or anti uh, uh, citrullinated peptid. Uh, 33 patients had spondyloarthropathy, including 15 patients with psoriasis and 21 patients had uh, undifferentiated polyarthritis. Other patients uh, mostly developed uh, musculoskeletal disorders, meaning that uh, they had no inflammatory uh, chronic symptoms. And the alternative uh, diagnoses for uh, the inflammatory forms were good. Uh, the patients were mostly women about 50 years old, 
um, most of patients reported a long-lasting acute stage and 20% uh, of patients had to be uh, supplemented in vitamin D. Uh, there were no significant differences in comorbidities between the groups. What concerns the treatment of the inflammatory uh, rheumatisms, um, we introduced uh, methotrexate in 77% uh, of uh, the, the, the chronic inflammatory rheumatisms. All the uh, rheumatoid arthritis were treated with methotrexate, 80% um, of spondyloarthropathy, and less than one third of undifferentiated polyarthritis. The efficacy rate of methotrexate was uh, 50, uh, uh, sorry, 75%, and the tolerance was globally good. Um, 12 patients had uh, to receive as a second line treatment biologic agents. What concerned methotrexate efficacy, the only significant uh, determinant was the early uh, start of the treatment, meaning within the first year of the, of the rheumatism. And uh, here I would like to present to you the most uh, severe patient of the cohort. He um, uh, is a 45-year-old man who were uh, naive to any uh, kind of uh, rheumatic disorder, uh, disorder prior to shake. And after an acute chikungunya infection, he developed uh, rheumatoid polyarthritis um, with deformities of the end and uh, bone destructions. Uh, here you can see a bilateral Carpite, here, arthritis and uh, bone erosions. And uh, he also had a bilateral coxitis um, and required a hip replacement. Indeed, among uh, all the patients, um, those we, we, w with uh, uh, chronic inflammatory rheumatisms had the worst uh, prognosis uh, globally. Uh, one third of the chronic inflammatory rheumatisms were destructive, and uh, this was, these were 70% uh, of the rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis and spondyloarthropathy had the heaviest burden, with one third uh, of job invalidity and 80% uh, of uh, daily life impact. So we can discuss uh, the limits uh, of the study and the strength. Um, obviously, the rheumatologist uh, recruitment uh, selected uh, the most severe forms of uh, post-chikungunya uh, chronic disorders, but it was necessary to, to isolate uh, patients with uh, chronic inflammatory rheumatism uh, to test in this group methotrexate efficacy. Um, a descriptive and retrospective study is not the best way to assess uh, um, efficacy of treatment, but uh, it enabled us to have a, a six-year insight uh, on, uh, on this, uh, this clinical spectrum, and uh, it was uh, so uh, uh, it provided so uh, a, a wideness uh, of uh, the rheumatic spectrum and enabled us to measure uh, the efficacy of the treatment. So um, we could, uh, we can also identify two type of uh, post-chikungunya chronic disorders. Um, the min minority of patients will have chronic inflammatory rheumatisms. Probably it will be around 5% of the patient with chronic pains. Um, These uh, rheumatisms uh, probably are due to auto-inflammatory or autoimmune disease and so have a chronic and destructive course requiring uh, a specific treatment with methotrexate. But uh, most of patients probably will develop uh, musculoskeletal disorder, which are, which are more uh, post-infectious inflammatory uh, disorders, and uh, so have a, a, a good uh, and resolutive uh, course, and uh, could be just treated with anti-inflammatory drugs, such as NAIDS or corticosteroids. Uh, what's the rationale for use of methotrexate in post polyarthritis? Um, actually, there is a, an overlap uh, between uh, uh, mechanisms of uh, chikungunya virus poly, uh, chronic polyarthritis and uh, the uh, rheumatoid polyarthritis, uh, as we know uh, today. Uh, the, the, 
the link between uh, the, the two diseases uh, is a central role of macrophage, and uh, that's uh, the target of uh, methotrexate uh, at a weekly low dose uh, used uh, there as an anti-inflammatory drug. So uh, we, c we recommend, uh, regarding to our result, uh, to treat uh, post chikungunya chronic rheumatisms uh, as any uh, kind of uh, chronic inflammatory rheumatism, uh, meaning to early start uh, methotrexate uh, treatment, as in uh, rheumatoid polyarthritis, in order to prevent from joint damage, damages. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this, uh, this, uh, this treatment could be uh, could be introduced at a low dose and then uh, rising up to uh, 15 milligram per week uh, using the intramuscular route if necessary. Um, and then when the maximum improvement is reached, uh, we can try to switch for an oral administration and to decrease uh, the doses. So to conclude, uh, we propose an algorithm to manage uh, people with uh, long-lasting uh, pain after acute sick. Um, uh, the first uh, point is that probably uh, the most risky population are a postmenopausal woman and a patient uh, who uh, had a long-lasting acute stage of the disease. Uh, the first step could be uh, to uh, correct them uh, for a vitamin D defic deficiency or a microcrystalline disorder such as GUT. And, uh, then uh, to promptly uh, recognize a patient who, who uh, fulfill criteria for uh, chronic inflammatory rheumatisms uh, using uh, clinical red flags uh, such as uh, polysynovitis, uh, stiffness, or psoriasis, uh, and uh, then to practice a biological test and imaging uh, to search for uh, radiographic destructions. Um, if a patient uh, has the criteria for chronic inflammatory rheumatisms, uh, you should uh, early start methotrexate. Uh, in this study, we said uh, within the first year, but probably within the first month, it could be uh, the best. And uh, this treatment uh, will be conduced at a weekly low dose, uh, as in uh, uh, rheumatoid polyarthritis. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Emily. I suggest, as we are in the same topic, to have questions after okay. the two presentations. So, Catherine, Marie Moutou, please. <laughs> A bit short. <laughs> we are still late, but on time for the session. So, thank you for inviting me. Uh, as it was said, I will present chikungunya infection in the point of view of epidemiological uh, um, research. And I will present you the long-lasting uh, um, morbidity of this uh, virus. So the story begins also in uh, 2006 with the large uh, chikungunya outbreak in Reunion Island. This outbreak uh, infected one-third of the population at this time. So in 2006, we decided to uh, study what was the impact for the military policemen deployed in Reunion Island. They were asked to fulfill a self-questionnaire to answer the question about being infected or not and what were the symptoms, and there was proposed serology. 662 military policemen completed both the questionnaire and the serological test. They were 23% to declare that they had been infected by chick um, virus, and there was only 19% positive serology, but we did have some issue about the serology testing because of cryoglobulins precipitation. But finally, the results were uh, highly concordant. In 2008, about uh, 30 years, 30 months after the infection, the same policemen were asked to answer a self-questionnaire about their conditions uh, two and a half years after the outbreak. There were only two-thirds to answer the questions, but uh, they also res responded that they were infected according to the serology. And at this time, we, we observed that the rheumatic morbidity was 
higher and the quality of life was lower among chick infected patients, whatever they declare they were ill of chick infection or not. The patients who declare they were ill are greater condition than non ill but whatever they were, uh, they declare more morbidity and lower quality of life than non-infected ones. Today's results will be based on the result of the third follow-up that was performed in uh, 2012. We asked uh, at this time, the, question, the objective of this follow-up was to see if the morbidity still persists and most and the question was, what was the possibility of return back to previous health status in this population? There was some self-questionnaire by post mail and uh, they received information about the first result of the studies. They was asked for informed consent and there was proposed new biological test that I will not present today because few answered that part. So we will focus on the symptoms since the lifetime and the medical care consumption and the current quality of life six years after infection. There were only 36% to answer the question at six years. There were 81 chick positive patients and 171 chick negative. All of them were about 44 years old and 95% were males. And it was interesting to see that at this time, when we asked the chic positive patient, do you consider your yield or cure of the disease? They mostly answered, I don't know. So we just compared positive to negative. In terms of traumatic symptoms, they were still, chic positive patients were still more frequently declaring uh, having uh, symptoms at least once a month. And, uh, the difference between shaking positive and negative was more important when it came for more severe, more severe and more rare symptoms like swelling, suggesting some synovitis in, in them. So it were, swelling was 10 times more frequent in positive than in negative. However, the, the symptoms were uh, largely lower, uh, lesser declared in uh, 2012 that in 2008 among chic positive subjects. On the contrary, the other symptoms were largely declared in 2012 for chic positive patients. Cr chronic fatigue, headache, and depression were two or three more frequent than in chic negative subjects. According to healthcare consumption, it can be seen that they also um, consulted their general practitioner on some uh, specialist of functional re-education, manual medicine, more frequently than others, than negative one. And they do uh, take more drugs, but these drugs were mainly uh, the, some minor painkillers, and the difference was significant for paracetamol only and the paracetamol was taken at least once a week for 40% of chick positive subjects and not, uh, uh, while uh, the chick negative did not take paracetamol or only once a month. The professional impact was very low. There was no difference in professional incapacity or in the number of work stoppage, but the chick positive subject did complain more frequently of uh, work difficulties, uh, difficulty to perform correctly their work. It was twice higher than in, among chic negative. And uh, they perceived their themselves as having a social disability in 72% a in, uh, of cases. This can be uh, objective by the um, quality of life uh, evaluation on the SF36 scale. In this scale, in this figure, you can see that on blue, you have the line of the mean quality of life uh, evaluation in chic positive. And you can see that all the dimension of quality of life are lower in these uh, patients, as well as the physical uh, health on the right, than uh, the social functioning or the mental health on the left. 
more interestingly, you can see that when projecting the evaluation in uh, 2008 in the broken uh, line, you have exactly the same uh, perception of quality of life. There is no improvement in the quality of life between 208 and 212 in among the six positive subjects. Of course, uh, you can have some discussion about the selection base on the cohort. There is uh, obviously um, there is um, an attrition in the cohort that was important, but it was much more important among chic negative subjects than in chic positive. So that authorizes us to perform valuable comparison between the two groups. Moreover. Uh, it's possible that uh, the chic positive subject that respond the, co the questionnaire are the most uh, symptomatic subjects. Um, and that may, might uh, increase the difference between positive and negative subjects. Um, on the contrary, we, we cannot know and we cannot um, be sure about the, the healthy condition of the chic uh, negative subject that responds, comp uh, comparing that to those who did not respond and we cannot uh, see if it can increase or decrease the difference. However, the difference in quality of life was very large in this cohort between positive and negative subjects, although the positive uh, subject did not um, did declare lower uh, rheumatic uh, disorders uh, six years after infection than two and a half years after. But they do declare chronic minor morbidities like headache and fatigue that has a long-term psycho psychological impact on their mental health. And they, they were more than 60% to declare they were exhausted or nervous or discouraged or sad uh, very often. And um, this could be explained by uh, lower tolerance to some minor disabilities in a cohort of patients composed of uh, workers, uh, good healthy workers, and young men in particular. In conclusion, we can see that chic infection has a very long-term impact on health. It will impact at long-term uh, as well social health and uh, um, mental health and decline quality of life due to chronic morbidities. And in this uh, cohort of young LC workers, the week, we can see that even six years after infection, there is no uh, return back to the LC condition they had before the infection. And we'll we would like to conclude about uh, the management of the, these patients uh, to underline that our results show that it is important to take into account the psychological aspect of the chronicity of the disease in parallel to take into account the somatic problems of the patients. Thank you for your attention and I would like to thank all the studies participants and my colleagues of the um, Department of Tropical Disease in the, in the military hospital of Marseille. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you to both of you for those interesting topics. We have time for one or two questions from the floor. No questions? One time, two times, three times? At <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for everybody to, to have stayed uh, so late and thank you so much to the presenters who respected their times and who made very interesting to uh, talks. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you to you, to the organizers. So we now move to the prize.